All right, well, hello everyone, and welcome back. In this video, we will cover two very important applications for AC circuits, including transformers and power distribution. So here's our goals for today's video. First, we will briefly review the complex power and maximum power transfer topics from our previous video. If you haven't already done so, please make sure that you have reviewed our previous videos on complex power so that you can better understand our material in this video. Next, we'll review how power is transferred across the power grid from a utility company all the way to the end customer. The reason this is important is because in order to transfer power through the power grid, we need to use a variety of electrical components, including transformers. So finally, towards the end of the video, we will review how to solve circuit problems containing transformers and coupled inductors. We'll see that these are really important tools used in order to shift our voltages up or down in many applications. So let's first start with a bit of review from our previous video. In our previous video, we reviewed the physical significance of the terms in complex power. We learned that S is the apparent power, or the magnitude of our complex power written in polar form. P is the real power, or the real component of our complex power. That's the power that we can actually use. Q is the reactive power, or the imaginary component. And theta is our power factor angle. As we learned, depending on the value of theta, the amount of power that is real and the amount of power that is imaginary can be varying greatly. So last time, we reviewed three different cases for the power factor angle. The ideal case is when our current and voltage are perfectly in phase, and when their phase angles are equal. But depending on the value of our current and voltage phase angles, we can also end up with leading or lagging behavior. So it's very important to be able to recognize which of these cases we're in. And of course, you'll remember, if we happen to have lagging behavior, we learn that we can add a parallel capacitor to our load in order to improve our power factor and make our load behave closer to the ideal case. Another important thing to remember that we covered last time is that you always want to specify leading versus lagging when reporting your power factor. So for example, if we have a power factor of 0.8, we need to specify whether that power factor is leading or lagging. The reason why is because inverse cosine of 0.8 could be either a positive or a negative number. So we always want to specify whether our power factor angle, theta v minus theta i, whether that difference is greater than or less than zero. If theta v minus theta i is greater than zero, we say our power factor is lagging. If theta v minus theta i is less than zero, we say our power factor is leading. So whenever you see a power factor, make sure you remember to specify whether a power factor is leading or lagging based on the values of your voltage and current phase angles. Finally, we also learned that it's possible to correct the power factor. Ideally, our power factor would be one and our current and voltage phasors would be perfectly in phase with each other. But of course, in real life, we learn that most of the time, the best we can do is get a power factor around 0 0.95. So if our power factor is not where we want it, 
and our circuit has lagging behavior, we can correct our power factor following this procedure. Take a look at our previous video for an example of this procedure in action. You'll remember that these equations that we use to correct our power factor, these come from trigonometry and our equation for the impedance of a capacitor. Finally, the last thing we learned in our previous video was maximum power transfer theorem for AC circuits. And so we learn that maximum power transfer theorem is actually somewhat similar to what we learned back in lecture 8 for DC circuits. So you'll remember we learned that the maximum average power will be transferred in an AC circuit's load when the impedance of our load, when the impedance of the load is equal to the complex conjugate of the source's Thevenin impedance. And if that condition is satisfied, we know that the maximum average power that we transfer will be given by the equation shown here. So this is a very important equation to remember because it can help us design AC circuits to transfer as much real power as possible. So before we move on, let's do one last review question on maximum power transfer. In this question, we're given that we have some sort of cable that connects an antenna to two TVs. And we're told that the antenna gives some voltage Vs of t, which is equal to 4 cosine omega t, and omega is 52 megahertz. We also know our cable's resistance is 200 ohms. So first part of the question asks to find the average power delivered to the TV sets if our load impedance for each TV is 300 ohms. And then second part of the question, what value of impedance for the TV should we choose if we want to transfer maximum power? And how much power would be delivered in that case? Well, we have an AC circuit problem, so let's go ahead and follow our usual procedure to solve this. Remember, our first step that we want to follow is we want to convert this circuit to frequency domain. So in this case, we'll get the following. Notice our voltage source is in millivolts, so I'm going to proactively change my voltage source to have volts units. I get 0 0.004 angle 0 degrees volts. I have my 200 ohm impedance from my resistor, and this whole thing is my source. Then, as stated in the problem, our load is two TVs in parallel with each other, and each of these has a 300 ohm impedance. You'll notice that we can immediately decide to combine those two 300 ohm impedances together. And let's go ahead and do that. And if we go ahead and combine those together, we'll have our same voltage source, 200 ohm resistor, our 200 ohm impedance, And now we have that equivalent impedance. So 
since we have two 300 ohm impedances in parallel, we'll just use our shortcut equation. And we'll determine that our equivalent impedance must be 150 ohms. So now we have our circuit in frequency domain, and we're basically ready to go. Let's now return to our part A from before. Notice our goal is to find the average power delivered. So we want to find average power delivered from the source. to the TV sets. So in this case, we need to use one of our equations for power. And in this case, specifically, we want to find the average power P. So there's a few different equations in our toolbox that we can use to find P. Can you think of which equations we'd want to use here? First possible option is we could choose to go the complex power route. We could find our complex power and take the real term. That would give us P. Another option is we could use the equation from our AC circuit toolbox from the instantaneous power. We know that P must also be equal to one half V M I M cosine theta V minus theta I. That's from our instantaneous power equation. And finally, we also know from our toolbox in our previous videos, we know that power can also be found by taking magnitude of our current phase or squared divided by 2 times the real component of z. And in this case, that would be the 150 ohm impedance that we want to find our voltage and current across. So there's many strategies you can take for this question. In this case, I'm going to go ahead and choose to use our instantaneous power equation, just because I think it's a little easier to find the magnitude and phase angle of my voltage and current. So let's go ahead and find our voltage and current phasors across Z equivalent, our load impedance. Remember, we want to find the average power delivered to the TV sets or to my load. So I need to plug in voltage and current only through Z equivalent. I don't want to plug in the voltage from my source because I only want the voltage and current through the impedance we're interested in. So let's give this a try. Let's find V and I and then substitute in to find our average power P. So if we go ahead and remind ourselves what our circuit is, our first step is to find V and I across that 150 ohm load impedance. So how would we find our voltage phasor V? Well, notice here the V across our 150 ohm load is not the same as the voltage from our source. 
due to the 200 ohm resistor. So in this case, let's go ahead and use voltage division. So if we do that, voltage division gives the following. So we plug into voltage division and we'll determine that our voltage V across our 150 ohm impedance, that voltage will be equal to 1.71 times 10 to the minus 3 angle 0 degrees volts, or just 1.71 times 10 to the minus 3 volts. All right, so we have our voltage across the 150 ohm impedance. So we know that the impedance of our load is 150 ohms. We know that the voltage across our load is 1.71 times 10 to the minus 3 volts. Now we need to find our current I across the load. How would we find I if we know V and Z? Well, in this case, the easiest approach would be to use Ohm's law. So in this case, we can say that our current I must be V over Z. And if we solve, that gives us 1.71 times 10 to the minus 3 volts divided by Z. But notice in this case, our Z for our load is 150 ohms. If we go ahead and plug in and solve for I, we'll determine that our I value will be 1.14 times 10 to the negative 5 amperes. Notice in this case you could have also chosen to take our voltage and then the impedances across the entire circuit and divided our voltage source by 350 ohms. You'd see either way you'd get the same result. All right, so now we know our current. Notice our current is completely real. We don't have any phase angle associated with it. So we can say that the voltage of our load is 1.71 times 10 to the minus 3 angle 0 degrees volts. And our current 1.14 times 10 to the minus 5 angle 0 degrees amperes. Remember, our goal is ultimately to find our average power P. So now we are ready to substitute in to our equation for P. All right, so let's go ahead and substitute in and see what we get. So we'll end up with the following. So in this case, we get one half times the magnitude of our voltage. That's just 1.71 times 10 to the minus 3 volts. Magnitude of our current was 1.14 times 10 to the minus 5 amperes. And in this case, both of our phase angles were zero. We substitute in, we'll determine that our power P will be equal to 9.7 nanowatts, or 9.7 times 10 to the minus 9 watts. And of course, in this case, we want to find the deliver power delivered to the TV sets, so this is to both TVs, 
If we divide by 2, that would give us 4.85 nanowatts per TV, since there were two in parallel. So we just finished the first part of the question. Second part asks us, what Z should we choose? For max power transfer. Well, in this case, we know that our source has a 200 ohm impedance. Our load is two impedances in parallel. So by the maximum power transfer theorem for AC circuits, we know that our load must equal the Thevenin and impedance of the source complex conjugate. Therefore, our load needs to have a 200 ohm impedance. But notice we have two impedances in parallel. We determine that the impedance for each TV must be 400 ohms. So we need 400 ohms per TV to transfer maximum power. Last part of the question asks how much power would be transferred if we did satisfy that condition? Well, to find that, we just use our equation that we learned. So we know that that maximum average power we will transfer will be 1 8 times the magnitude of our Thevenin voltage phasor squared divided by the real part of our Thevenin impedance of our source. So if we substitute in, we determine we get 1 8 times, we have 0 0.004 volts squared divided by our Thevenin impedance, which is 200 ohms. If we plug everything in and solve, that will give us 1 times 10 to the minus 8 watts, which is 10 nanowatts total, or 5 nanowatts to each TV. And there we have it. We have successfully determined the optimal Z value for maximum power transfer. All right, so definitely make sure that you understand these AC power topics very well. These are really important to understand for the next part of the class, and also because these types of questions will certainly appear on our final exam. Let's now move on to talk about AC power delivery and then transformers. Notice that AC power delivery is a required part of our curriculum, but we're just going to spend a little bit of time on it before moving on to transformers. So please do focus on these slides for the key terms and topics that you'll want to remember. So first, let's discuss briefly how electrical power is able to be transferred from a power plant all the way to individual homes. And so it turns out that each individual home in the U.S. typically has three wires delivered to that home. We get a white wire that is connected to ground, or zero volts. We have a black wire with 120 volt RMS and zero degree phase angle. And we have a red wire with 120 volt RMS, but notice the phase is exactly opposite. So this one has a 180 degree phase angle. And within a standard US home, 
the power outlets typically are connected as shown. Typically what happens is we have some ground connection to connect our load to the earth ground, and that we'll see later is for primarily safety reasons. And then within the other two plugs of our power outlet, we're able to supply a 120 volt RMS power difference or potential difference across the black and the white wires. So why do we need grounding? So here's a little bit of context about why that ground is a really good addition. It turns out that even small amounts of electrical current can be dangerous. If you look up the health risks of electricity, you can see that it doesn't take very many amperes of current before that current can seriously hurt you. Notice above around 20 milliamps, electrical current can become quite painful. And you'll notice that if you get up into close to amp range, you can get severe burns and life-threatening conditions. So it's very important that we handle our electrical components very carefully, and we definitely want to avoid exposing ourselves to even small amounts of electrical current. Especially when working with circuits that have very high voltage, those can potentially generate very large amounts of current. So here's a brief explanation of how grounding improves safety. The problem with ungrounded loads is that there could be some small voltage difference between the zero volt white wire in our circuit and the true ground that a person might be in contact with. So if you were to come into contact with an ungrounded load, there could be some voltage difference between this so-called zero volt potential and the ground. And therefore, some amount of current could potentially flow between you and the ground, causing electrical shock. If we make sure our load is grounded, then we guarantee that both the zero volts of our load as well as the zero volts of our ground are at the same potential. And therefore, it's not possible for any current to flow from that load through you because both the grounded load and your ground are sitting at the same potential. So adding a ground can greatly improve the safety and it's an extremely good practice to follow when you're working with electronics. And remember that even small amounts of current really can be dangerous and hazards can also be potentially made more dangerous depending on the environmental conditions like moisture or the types of shoes or soles that you have on your feet and other factors. So key takeaway here, make sure that you ground your circuits in order to provide safety for you and those around you. One additional safety feature that is important to point out is the GFCI, Ground Fault Circuit Interrupter. You may have seen some of these GFCI circuits in, in your home, especially around places with water, like kitchens and bathrooms. The GFCI has a very special kind of safety precaution in it, in that the, the GFCI has continuous monitoring of the current flowing through our hot wire and our neutral wire. And the GFCI will constantly measure the current running through our hot and our neutral wires. If we see that all of a sudden a significant difference in current is observed, that could potentially suggest that an electrical shock or something is happening such that current is flowing elsewhere. So as a safety precaution, the GFCI will disconnect the circuit from electricity and 
as a safety precaution, it will just completely shut off the circuit. And this is a really great way to help protect people. For example, if you're using like a hairdryer or something in the bathroom and that hairdryer falls into a sink full of water, it could potentially produce some electric shock when it falls into water. And so this GFCI would disconnect and prevent a potentially serious safety concern. So GFCIs are a very nice safety circuit that is now very commonly used. All right, so let's now talk just a little bit more about AC power and how we distribute it. So typically, power plants actually produce electrical power at a voltage around 18 kilovolts. This is very different than the 120 volts RMS we see in our power outlets. And it turns out that when we're doing long distance transport of power, we actually increase the voltage even higher. This helps us avoid losses in our transmission. So we need to take this power from 345 kilovolts all the way down to 120 volts in order for us to be able to use it at home. And so there's actually quite a few steps of this process, and we use substations and transformers to help us take that power from the power plant and tra transmission lines and convert it down into the voltages that we want. Let's go through a few key terms. Please make sure that you're familiar with these key terms for the purposes of our class. If you choose to take additional electronics courses, you'll probably learn about these terms in even greater detail. First is the power grid. The power grid is the network of transmission lines and substations that supply power. So transmission lines are the thing that carries electric current from power stations or from the power plant over long distances. And finally, substations convert that high voltage power from our transmission lines down to lower voltages and then distribute that lower voltage power to customers. Here's a few other important terms to know. Single phase power is AC power that's transferred using a single sinusoidal source. So we just have a single sinusoidal wave transferring our power. It turns out that while we might use single phase power in the lab when doing an experiment, often in the electrical grid, we tend to use three phase power for distributing our power. In three phase power, we actually have three separate sinusoidal voltages and each one is exactly 120 degrees out of phase with each other. We call these three balanced voltages. So they're voltages which have equal amplitude and equal frequency, but they're out of phase by 120 degrees. The reason we choose to use three phase power instead of single phase power is we're able to deliver constant instantaneous power. And we're also able to deliver this power more efficiently. It also helps avoid fluctuations if some part of our circuit happens to be more sensitive to certain frequencies and certain phases. So most electrical power, in fact, uses three phase for distribution. So if you work with three phase power, you may also see it being called the Y configuration. And again, in three phase power like this, each of the voltages is 120 degrees out of phase with the others. So why do we bother talking about electrical distribution for this course? Well, it turns out that one of the really important applications of transformers and magnetic circuits is assisting with distribution of electric power. 
And we saw in those figures earlier that we need to be able to convert our electric power from 18 kilovolts all the way up to hundreds of kilovolts and then back down to 120 volts. And so in order to cause our voltage to step up and step down in this way, we need to use things called transformers in order to help us transform our voltage up or down. So please note, transformers are one of the last major new topics for this course. And there will be a question about transformers on the final exam and in our last homework assignment. So please make sure that you understand these topics. So what is a transformer? A transformer is a device that couples two AC circuits magnetically rather than through a direct connection. What this means is instead of actually physically connecting two wires together, we are using inductors and magnetic fields in order to transfer current. Remember that inductors can actually induce current flow in each other using overlap of magnetic fields. So to make a transformer, we take two inductors where the magnetic field overlaps and we use that. So a coupled inductor, therefore, are two or more coils wound around some common core. So often these are like metal coils wound around some magnetic or conductive core. And they're wound around the core so that the magnetic fields overlap. And this allows us to have one coil induce current flow in the other. And so one of the most important applications of transformers and coupled inductors is for raising or lowering AC voltages for power transmission. Another important application is isolating parts of circuits from others. And these, these circuits can also be used in things like RFID, where we use an RFID tag or RFID badge in order to open doors or transmit signals. Specifically for transformers, we can design multiple kinds. A step-up transformer will increase the voltage from one lower voltage to a higher one. Step-down transformers will decrease a higher voltage to a lower one. So for the last part of this video, let's spend some time talking about transformers and transformer theory. We'll briefly learn some new tools and some new key terms, and then we'll end with a few examples. Another very important point to be aware of when working with transformers and coupled inductors is this dot convention. When we look at transformers in the circuit diagram, we use a dot to indicate the way the coils have been wrapped. This is important because this helps us figure out where the positive polarity in our coils are located. We assume coils follow the passive convention so, so that the positive current enters the positive end. We also assume that if dots are not given, then we would assume the voltage and current have both dots on top such that voltage and current are in phase. So if you have a coupled inductor or transformer circuit, pay attention to these dots, because these tell us which way the coil has been wound. And depending on these dots, you might have different equations governing the behavior. So you want to make sure you use the equations corresponding to the coil orientation. Another important term that comes up when working with transformers and coupled inductors is the mutual inductance, or M. Mutual inductance describes how well our magnetic fields overlap. So 
This actually depends on a lot of physical properties like the core of the material and the number of turns. And so you can see that the more turns that the coils have, the more favorable the material, the higher that M value. And usually M is given in Henry's. So suppose we have two coupled inductors and some mutual inductance M. How do we know how much current and voltage we're able to produce? It turns out that if we use our toolbox equations for inductors and Kirchhoff's laws, we can actually derive some expressions for voltage relationships of coupled inductors. So for our purposes, we actually don't use these equations too much, but we do use them to derive more relationships later on. So it turns out for our class, we actually have a separate transformer toolbox that we'll use in order to solve coupled inductor problems. But we share these equations because these are the equations used to derive our transformer toolbox. And the key thing to notice here is that the voltage behavior depends on the coil orientation. So notice, depending on which way your coils are wound, you can potentially have addition or subtraction in your equations. So you want to definitely make sure that you use the correct equation depending on the orientation of your coils. All right, we have a few more important terms to cover before we do our examples. First important term is primary versus secondary coil. A lot of the time when we're working with transformers, we tend to have one coil that's connected to a source and a second coil which is connected to a load. So we say the primary coil is the coil that is connected to a voltage or current source, while the secondary coil is connected to a passive component, like an impedance or some other load. Finally, another really important term is the coupling coefficient. We'll be taking a closer look at this coefficient during some of our labs. The coupling coefficient describes how efficiently we transfer voltage between the coils of our transformer. And this coupling coefficient must be some value between 0 and 1. And so we'll see, in fact, for the ideal transformers that we work with, we typically assume that our coupling coefficient k equals 1. So we assume perfect coupling for the purposes of this class. Depending on the situation, you may not be able to assume perfect coupling, so it's important to pay attention to the information in the questions. For our purposes, 99% of the time, we assume that we do indeed have ideal transformers and a coupling coefficient of 1. So why do we care about transformers and coupled inductors? As we mentioned, these have many important applications. The biggest one that we're going to cover is transformers, or converting voltage up and down. But you've probably used coupled inductors in other places as well. For example, wireless charging, RFID tags, or any sort of toy that contains RFID, or keys, badges, and even things like electric motors. So it's very important to know how these coupled inductors and transformers behave. So let's now take a closer look at ideal transformers. For the purposes of our course, we generally assume that our transformers always have ideal behavior unless otherwise noted. 
So an ideal transformer is a transformer with a coupling coefficient of 1, meaning that the voltage and currents are transferred perfectly across the primary and secondary coils. And if we have ideal transformers, it's actually quite nice. You'll see that there's a symbol like this one with the three vertical lines. And we can actually model ideal transformers using dependent sources. So let's go ahead and cover a few important tools and equations that you need to know about transformers. Then we'll do some examples to show how all this stuff fits together. The first important quantity for ideal transformers is called the turns ratio, or n. The turns ratio is basically the ratio of the number of turns in the secondary and primary coils. So you can see in this case, n2 is the secondary, n1 is the primary. So turns ratio tells us that ratio between number of coils in the secondary and number of turns in the primary coil. And you'll see that based on that turns ratio, we can derive some dependent sources to model the behavior of our transformers. There's also a really important toolbox equation that is very useful when working with ideal transformers. It turns out that we can replace an ideal transformer by an equivalent load impedance. So notice if I have this transformer here connected to my primary coil, I can replace that transformer with an equivalent load. And so instead of having a transformer there, I can instead have an impedance, which makes it often a little bit easier to solve for unknowns. So if I want to replace a transformer by an equivalent impedance, I need to use this equation shown here, where the equivalent impedance The equivalent impedance is equal to n1 over n2 squared, that's basically 1 over n, where n is our turns ratio, times z of omega, where this is our initial impedance. On the secondary coil. So notice if I know the impedance of my secondary coil and I know my turns ratio, I can replace that transformer with an equivalent impedance. We'll see in a moment that this can greatly simplify transformer problems. So finally, to help everybody solve transformer problems, I've compiled a few other equations into what I call the ideal transformer toolbox. Make sure you keep these equations handy. I guarantee you, you're going to need them on our last homework assignment and on our final exam. So you'll definitely want to know how to use these equations. So notice that depending on the orientation of our transformer coils, we have slightly different equations relating the voltage and current across our transformer. So depending on the coil orientation, We can use these toolbox equations We can use these toolbox equations to relate our voltage and current 
on both sides of the transformer. I've also added the turns ratio to our toolbox, as well as the equation that we covered for replacing the transformer with an equivalent impedance. Once again, please make sure that you take the time you need to get comfortable using these equations. I guarantee you you're going to need them on the last homework and on the final exam. Let's now practice using this toolbox by finishing up with a few examples of how we would solve transformer questions. Let's start with this first example. In this question, we're given a transformer circuit. Notice it is an ideal transformer because we have those three vertical bars. We are told that n equals 5, z load is 100 minus j75, and z1 is 2 plus j3. Using this information and our transformer toolbox, we now need to determine I1 and I2. Notice I1 is the current through the primary coil. I2 is the current that is basically induced in the secondary coil by the transformer. So how would we approach this? Well, if we look at our transformers that we have, we need to be able to find I1 and I2. And notice in this case, we do know what our load is. So a good place to start would be replacing our transformer with an equivalent impedance. And why would we want to do that? Well, if we replace our transformer with an equivalent impedance, then we can solve for I1. And then once we know I1, we can use the transformer toolbox to find I2. So let's give this a try. Our goal is to take this transformer and replace it with an equivalent impedance. And we know, once again, that our Z1 is 2 plus J3. We want to find our voltage V and our current I1. So V1 and I1. We know that our voltage here is 12 angles, 0 degrees. So first, we need to figure out what that equivalent impedance will be. Let's take a look back in our transformer toolbox. In our transformer toolbox, you can see the equation we need to use to find that equivalent impedance. Here we know our n value and we know our impedance of the load, so we just need to substitute. So we know our equivalent impedance will be 1 over n squared times impedance of our load that is currently there. That will give us 1 fifth squared times 100 minus J75. That's the same as writing 1 25th times 100 minus J75. Since the 1 25th is completely real, we can just multiply through, or if you prefer, you can use a phasor calculator. Either way, you will see that if we multiply 1 25th through, we will end up 
with our z equivalent being equal to 4 minus j3 ohms. So now that we know both of our impedances, and we know our voltage source, now we can solve for I1. And in this case, to find I1, all we need to do is use Ohm's law. Notice we can combine the series impedances. And now all of a sudden, our total impedance in our circuit on the, just on the source side becomes 2 plus J3 plus 4 minus J3. Well, that's convenient. Our imaginary terms cancel, and we determine our impedance is just 6 ohms. So then by Ohm's law, we can determine I1 is just V over Z, or 12 angle 0 degrees, divided by 6 angle 0 degrees, which gives us 2 angle 0 degrees amps, or just 2 amps. So now we have successfully found our current I1. Okay, well, now we know I1. How do we find I2? What transformer toolbox equation can we use? Well, if you take a look in our transformer toolbox, notice our coils are out of phase. So we need to choose the equation that I1 equals N2 over N1 times I2. Therefore, we can say that I1 equals 5 times I2. Remember, N is N2 over N1, or is 5. So therefore, if we have 2 amps equals 5 times I2, we determine that our current I2 must be 2 fifths amperes, or 0 0.4 amperes. And that's all there is to it. Notice that circuits containing transformers are actually pretty straightforward to solve as long as you know how to use the transformer toolbox. So definitely keep that transformer toolbox handy and make sure you spend some time doing examples to get familiar with how to use those equations. Let's try a couple more examples before we finish for today. All right, let's try our second example here. In this example, our turns ratio is not known. We want to find the turns ratio needed to cause maximum power transfer if Z load is eight ohms and Z source is 48 ohms. Here we are given that both of our dots are on the top end of the coil. Let's go ahead and give this question a try. A big hint here is maximum power transfer. If you ever see maximum power transfer in a question, you should be happy because you'll know immediately what equations you should use to approach this question. Let's remind ourselves what maximum power transfer theorem says. 
So remember, for maximum power to be transferred, the impedance of our source must equal, or the Thevenin imp impedance of our source must equal Thevenin and impedance of our source must be the same as the complex conjugate of our load. Well, in this case, if we look at Thevenin and impedance of our source, that's 48 plus 0j. So that means that our load impedance must be equal to 48 minus 0j, or 48 ohms. So notice what our task is. We know right now that Z load across the transformer is 8 ohms. That's not our desired 48 ohms. So in this case, we need to find the turns ratio so that the transformer will be equivalent 48 ohm load impedance needed for max power transfer. So remember our equation. We know that if we replace our transformer by an equivalent impedance, we want that equivalent impedance to be 48. And that equivalent impedance is also equal to 1 over n squared times z load. Therefore, we can write that 48 ohms must equal 1 over n squared times 8 ohms. Therefore, 6 ohms is equal to 1 over n squared, and we can determine in this case that 1 over n is equal to square root of 6, or that our turns ratio n must be 1 divided by square root of 6. If our turns ratio is 1 over square root of 6, that will allow our transformer to produce the equivalent impedance with the same value as needed for max power transfer. All right, let's finish up with one last example that kind of covers everything that we have learned up to this point. In this example, we are asked to determine the complex power delivered to the loads transformer. That's this one here. So we want to find the complex power S delivered to that load transformer by the voltage source. We're also given our voltage source as a sinusoid and the resistance and inductance on our load. So let's briefly take a moment to talk strategy. First, First approach would be to convert to frequency domain, since we're working in AC. Next, remember that our complex power S is equal to VI star divided by 2. And in our case, here, we want our voltage to be V2. Our voltage is the voltage delivered to the load transformer. And notice our current I that we plug in is going to be I2, the current in the load transformer. So key takeaway here is to pay attention. Pay attention to what you want to find complex power across. 
and you really want to make sure you plug in the correct current and voltage. All right, so now we have our strategy. We want to convert to frequency domain and then determine V2 and I2, the voltage and current that are present in our load side. Once we know V2 and I2, we can use our complex power equation. So in frequency domain, we get the following. Notice our voltage becomes 12 angle 15 degrees volts. And in this case, notice we can find our impedance Z here. That's just impedance of our resistor plus impedance of the inductor. And we were given those. Our resistor is just a 20 ohm resistor. Impedance of our inductor is J omega L. In this case, our omega is 40, and L is 1.25. So our impedance Z in our load becomes 20 plus J50 ohms. So now that we're in frequency domain, we need to find V2 and I2. And notice we know V1. How is V1 related to V2? What toolbox equation could we use? Well, from our toolbox, Our coils are in phase, so we know that V1 must equal N1 over N2 times V2. So therefore, we can write 12 angle 15 degrees must be equal to 4 divided by 15 times V2. If we solve for V2, we determine V2 is equal to 45 angle 15 degrees. All right, so we found V2. How do we find I2? How about Ohm's law? We know Z, we know V2. So we go ahead and plug in. We've got 45 angle 15 degrees in the numerator. We've got 20 plus J 50 ohms in our denominator. That gives us 45 angle 15 degrees divided by, using our converter, that will give us 53 0.852 angle 68.2 degrees. And therefore, if we math it out, we determine that I2 will be equal to 0 0.83563 angle negative 53.2 degrees amperes. All right, so we have V2 and I2. The last thing we need to do is solve for our complex power. So in this case, let's go ahead and substitute in. And of course, be careful here, make sure you take the complex conjugate.
So notice I did take my complex conjugate. And I divide all that by 2. Or you can write 2 angle 0 degrees if you prefer. If you plug everybody in, up top we will determine that we have 37.603 angle 68.2 degrees divided by 2 angle 0 degrees. That gives us 18.7875 angle 68.2 degrees volt amperes. If we convert it to rectangular, we will determine that our complex power S will be approximately 6.977 plus J 17.44 volt amperes. And there we have it. Notice normally the question would tell you what form to write the complex power. So you'd want to pay attention to whether you needed to write your complex power in polar or rectangular form. All right, so let's go ahead and wrap up here for today. You should now be more comfortable finding maximum power transfer in an AC circuit. And now you should also understand how power is transferred across the grid and why transformers are really important in transferring power from a power plant all the way to an end consumer. And finally, make sure you get really comfortable with our transformer toolbox. Please take some time to go back through the examples we covered and make sure you know how to use those tools to solve circuits containing transformers. Next class, we'll finish up a couple more examples on transformers and with an introduction to more devices. Thanks, everyone, and we'll see you in the next video.